Bhagavate Vāsudevāyā Today we are reading from Śrīmad Bhagavatam, Canto 8, Chapter 14, entitled The System of Universal Management, Text 7 and 8. In the previous chapters, Srimad Bhagavatam explains the story of the churning of the ocean of milk. Therein, the devas, despite their power, fame, and opulence, are put in a situation of terrible suffering that is beyond their control. Krishna tells in Gita, Abrama bhuvana loka punar abhartanorjana mamu pejitu kontaya punar janmana vidyate. The nature of this material existence is that suffering is inevitable. Whoever we are, wherever we are, from the highest planet to the lowest, there is this consistency that because everything is temporary, dukalaya mashashvatam, We have to suffer. The cause of the suffering is the very same cause of happiness at root. Ananda Mayobhyashat. That the supreme absolute truth is the ultimate enjoyer of infinite pleasure. And mamayvam so jiva loke jiva bhutana sanata. Because we are part and parcel of Krishna. We are Satchit ananda. We also exist for the purpose of pleasure. But because the soul is eternal, and the relationship of love between the soul and God is eternal. The pleasure of that relationship is the origin of all pleasure. In fact, it is the only reality of pleasure. The ecstasy of the divine substance of the soul. And its culmination is the exchange of love between God and the soul. But in this material creation, forgetting our own spiritual identity, which is eternal and full of knowledge and bliss, forgetting our loving relationship with the Supreme Absolute Truth, we try to find that pleasure through the temporary experiences of the body and the mind. And all these facilities, anything that gives us any level of pleasure, we naturally become attracted to it. To the degree it gives us pleasure, we become practically addicted to it. Why? Because it's connecting us to our original desire of wanting to enjoy a loving relationship with Krishna. Krishna is all attractive. 
And Krishna tells in Gita, all the attractive, beautiful things of this entire creation are but a spark of his splendor. This material existence is a reflection of our own spiritual reality. The real substance of pleasure cannot really be enjoyed here. Just a reflection. A reflection of a single spark. can infatuate and obsess not only humans and animals and insects and plants, but even the devatas, the demigods. What to speak of the original source? Whatever pleasures in this world, according to the analogy often used, is like a reflection of a single sun ray. Compare that to the quantity of pleasure of the entire sun planet, which includes all sun rays, but not the reflection, the real substance. That is the pleasure of reconnecting with Krishna. It is not that seeking pleasure is something that people just like to do. Because of the nature of the soul, eternally, seeking pleasure is the absolute necessity of existence. And he, the great tapasis or yogis who give up physical temporary pleasure, they're doing it to experience a higher pleasure. It may be the pleasure of Brahman realization, Paramatma realization, or the full-fledged all-inclusive realization is that of Bhagavan. But everyone's seeking pleasure. These beautiful stories in the scriptures are so important because we are so much conditioned, habituated to finding alternative pleasures to that of the real soul's love for God. But whoever we are and whatever we accomplish, because within this worldly existence, everything is temporary and limited. Everything ultimately brings suffering. You become attached to something, and you lose it. That's material existence. And then you get attached to something else, and you lose it, and you lose it. Some may question, why did God create like this? Where anything you get attached to, you have to lose and you have to suffer. Why? If we didn't lose these things, the soul would likely just go on trying to enjoy these petty little reflections of tiny little sparks of real substance forever. But the sufferings of this world, however small or great they may be, are ultimately created by material energy for the purpose of waking us up to what we really want for the purpose of sobering us. Krishna wants to give us the best, but we're so obsessed with taking the worst. 
So a loving mother and father, will she just let the children carry on taking the worst? Sometimes some suffering is necessary so that we'll take seriously what we really have within us that we've forgotten. When Srila Prabhupada came to the Western world in the early days of our society, he was asked, why have you come? He said, I have come to remind you of what you have forgotten. That we're all eternal souls, full of knowledge and bliss. We all have a relationship with Krishna, and that love for Krishna is within us. We find in these stories of Srimad Bhagavatam, even the demigods. And this story is really, if we take them seriously, which is the intention in which these scriptures are written, that we take them seriously, that it really bursts the bubble of our illusions. We're thinking that by making some excellent material arrangement, we're going to be happy and find security and stability by getting more money, by better health, by more influential people around us, by power, prestige. Well, nobody in this earth planet, however successful, can compare to the, dem to the demigods. Even the wealthiest, most powerful person in this planet, hardly a single one of them lives to a hundred years old. Now for an little, some little insects, they're born at sunset, and they go through an entire lifespan with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. <laughs> they go through their infancy, their babyhood, their childhood, their adolescence, then their middle age, old age, really old age. <laughs> and by the time of the sun rays, for those who survive, they die, die of really old age. Yes? Now, for those little insects, because many of them don't live till the sunrise, they really consider what an expansive, fantastic life he lived till the sun rises. <laughs> oh, what is a, for, compared to demigods, for us to live a hundred years is not even that. Our six months is hardly one day for the demigods. Yes? They live extremely long lives. Up to Lord Brahma, who lives over 311 trillion years. Same body. So these demigods, they have long lives and they have great power and they're always in good health. We never read in the scriptures about a demigod with, with cancer, <laughs> or hepatitis, getting strokes or heart attacks. Doesn't exist. Those things are just for little earth people. Demigods, they don't have. They don't even go old, really. They just, they. When their karma runs out, they just have to leave their bodies and leave everything behind. They don't have to go through all this old age stuff like we do, not the same. It's like, more like a shift of posts. They're just transferred out according to their karmas to the next place. 
And here we find the demigods. Because the nature of this world is everyone is looking for pleasure. And the soul has an unlimited capacity to enjoy pleasure. Because its capacity is in Krishna, who's unlimited. And right in the middle of everything, at the peak of their lives, when everything's so good, there are other people who want what we have. It's the nature of material existence. Wherever you go, envy. Essentially, we come to this world because we want to be enjoyers. But factually, our constitutional position is jivara swarupoi krishna ranityadas. We're eternal servants of Krishna. Bhoktaram yagyatapasam sarva lokameshvara suhridam sarva bhutanam gyatvamam shanti mrichchati. Just to understand this truth will bring about real peace forever. Krishna is the real proprietor of everything. He's the real enjoyer of everything. And he's the real best friend of every living being. But we want to be proprietor. We want to be enjoyer. And we want to consider that I am the beneficiary of others. By my goodness, other people are being maintained. Or by my badness, other people suffer. We want to control. This is material illusion. But because everybody essentially has, when we come to this conditioned state, it is due to the root cause of being envious of God's position. And in that state, we are potentially envious of everyone and anyone who impedes the progress of what I want. If someone has more than me, or something has, someone has something that I want, our tendency is envy. And because of that ego, I'm the enjoyer, and the envy that comes from it, there's so much conflict, so much war, so much disunity, disparity between people. If we look at the animal kingdom, on one level it's very beautiful to see what's happening. You know, the birds are singing and flying. Now we're enjoying seeing the birds singing and flying, but the worm is not enjoying seeing the bird because this bird is singing and flying, looking to eat the worm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Little insects are being eaten by the birds. And the insects are eating littler insects. And I was just in an airport, and one company is talking about saving the tigers. There's only, I think, 1,411 tigers left in India. Very good. I mean, as far as trying to save the tigers, they're people, beautiful species. But the deers, <laughs> the deers, they would be in ecstasy <laughs> if the tigers were f forever extinct from the world, right? Because tigers eat deers, they eat their children. They eat their wives, their husbands, and at any minute they may eat them. So everything is so relevant, relative. But jiva jiva sa jivanam. The one living being is eating another living being for survival. Isn't that something to think about? Why the world was made like this, where we have to eat each other? just to live, yes? 
the spiritual world when Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was in Jarikanda. He was showing what spiritual life is like. You do not have to eat each other. <laughs> God provides everything plentifully, beautifully, wonderfully. And everything's eternal. There's no death. But this world, death is imminent everywhere. So these tigers and the deers, they are worst of enemies. Tiger only thinks of deers in terms of eating them. They don't think about, oh, such nice sparkling eyes. <laughs> and they, the way they jump is so graceful. Yes, when we see a deer jumping, we think, oh, what a beautiful work of art. How graceful they're jumping and how beautiful their eyes are sparkling and how nice. The psychology of a tiger, when they think of deer, it's only one thing, their taste, <laughs> what they taste like. Not only the taste of their blood, but also you know, how that will diminish the pain of hunger in their stomachs. And the deers, when they think of tigers, they don't think, oh, such beautiful stripes. <laughs> and so heroic and so fearless and the deers don't think let's name our team after the tigers <laughs> <laughs> to show people how strong and ferocious we can be it's the king of the jungle oh, they, they, when they think of the tiger they're stricken with fear and hatred this is, the, this, is the, this is the being that has killed my relatives. And this is the being that at any moment is going to kill me. So what is the relationship between tiger and deer? Fear, exploitation, hatred. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu told the tigers to chant Hare Krishna. Then he told the deers to chant Hare Krishna. And they were all dancing and chanting along with Lord Chaitanya. And during the kirtan, it was so ecstatic that they, the tigers and the deers, they gathered in the same place. And amazingly, the tigers were no longer looking at the deers as food. And the deers were no longer looking at the tigers as death personified. They were seeing each other's eternal souls. The holy name of Krishna helps us to see the spiritual essence in each other and how Krishna is the connecting force between us. And bhakti or devotion is our relationship with Krishna with each other. And the tigers and deers began to embrace each other. And not in a romantic way, but in a very spiritual way, they kissed each other. Hare Krishna. In ecstatic spiritual love, Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was looking at them thinking, this is just like Vrindavan. This is eternally what happens in the spiritual world. All living beings, they love each other because everyone is self-sufficient. No one's in need of anything. Everyone is simply giving, giving, giving their heart's loves to each other, to Krishna. So that is the spiritual world. But the material world is created in such a way that for my survival, I have to exploit something or someone else. And human existence is to minimize as far as possible in a spirit of service and rather than exploitation. We also need to eat in this material existence but fresh vegetables and fruits and other such natural 
where we, where we inflict minimal violence and pain on other living beings. And then where that food and the mode of goodness is, where there is minimal violence and pain, when we offer, offer it with love and devotion to Krishna, we're actually helping to liberate the souls of those vegetables and grains and fruits. It's not an act of exploitation. It's an act of loving service. So demigods, in previous chapters of Bhagavat, we find they lose everything. And it happens from time to time. In fact, the Puranas, the Srimad Bhagavatam, especially select those historical moments where the demigods lose everything. <laughs> There's not many interesting stories about when they're just enjoying life as usual. Right? Because there's not much lesson in that. But what they do when they lose everything, that's where the lesson is. They realize, I'm helpless. I need the help of God, of God, of Vishnu. And in every step, Krishna's there to reciprocate. If we turn to him, with sincerity, with the sense of real urgency. In this particular verse that we're reading today, we find how, and Srila Prabhupada writes in purport, for the benefit of all human society, not only does the Lord assume the form of Manu as an incarnation to rule the universe properly, but he also assumes the form of a teacher, yogi, jnani, and so on, for the benefit of human society. That the Vedic literatures are like a desire tree. according to one's inclination, according to one's aspiration, according to one's level of consciousness, one can take to a path that will bring us to the ultimate goal. Or one can take, the Vedas also provide paths that regulate our life either slightly or greatly give us a higher realization of happiness within material existence, try to bring us from ignorance to passion to goodness, eventually to bring us to the point of surrendering to the Lord. Therefore, there are many forms of dharma taught by different sages, yogis, jnanis, and Essentially, in their pure forms, they are all presented by the Lord to elevate human society. You know, some people's conception of God, either you accept, you know, you accept this or you're going to hell forever. But God is so merciful. In the Vedic tradition, we learn that it comes in so many ways. And even if you're not willing to take to spiritual life, he's, he's presenting higher material alternatives so that you can become less implicated in karma. And eventually, you can become a little more pious. And that will bring one to associating with higher and higher types of people. And eventually, you're on the path, maybe a very slow path. Tribadam, what is that? Trigunya Vishaya Veda, Nistraigunya Bhavarjana. Krishna tells in Gita that the Vedas only, mainly deal with the three modes of material nature. 
The Vedas mainly teach us how to live a more noble and proper life and enjoy more pious pleasures within the modes of material nature. But then Krishna tells Arjuna and tells the world, go beyond all these modes of nature. Go beyond the flowery words of the Vedas. These dharmas are all meant for the purpose of either rapidly or gradually bringing us to sanatana dharma. Sarva dharma paritya Mame kam sharanam braja aham tvam sarva papi pyo moksha ishami masaja. Abandon all varieties of dharma or religious thought and action and just surrender to me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. This is Krishna's promise. And Krishna tells in Gita that people who are performing these lower types of dharmas, we should not unsettle their minds. We should invite them, try to inspire them to reach the conclusion which anyone can do at any time in this age by just surrendering to God, not as the enjoyer, but as the servant. Most religious thought is about trying to dovetail our enjoying propensity so that we enjoy a little more piously. So that we learn to enjoy charity more than just accumulation. So that we learn to enjoy helping others rather than just being selfish about our own needs. It's a higher pleasure. And it brings us closer and it makes us more inclined towards Sanatan Dharma. Which is to give up all selfishness altogether and not only help people on the platform of their bodies and their minds, but helping to deliver their souls. Because when we're on the bodily platform of life, real service to others is serving what we identify with, their bodily needs. Yes, that is philanthropy, altruism. Helping the bodily and mental needs of others which is religious life. Otherwise, we don't care about others. We care about me. We care about I and mine. But through this type of developing a service attitude on the material platform, we gradually become receptive. That's the whole purpose of piety and philanthropy, is it helps us to come to the mode of goodness and become more receptive to understand our own spiritual identity and the spiritual identity of others. And we want to uplift their souls, not just by giving some temporary relief, but by helping to be instruments of compassion to give people an eternal liberated state of ecstatic devotion. Para upakar. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, it is the supreme welfare work, the greatest of all types of charity, is to awaken another person's eternal soul. Sarva dharma parityasya, mame kam sharanam So the devas, they get naturally um, implicated and distracted by their power, their prestige, and the incredible opportunities for enjoyment they have. So the Srimad Bhagavatam doesn't give too much time talking about how they're enjoying those things in the service of God. They're all doing seva to the Lord. This particular chapter explains that the Lord's agents, the manus, 
the Lord's agents, his incarnations, his empowered people, they're the ones that give this service to the, dev to the devas. Imagine Indra. What a powerful position he has. A father, mother, takes certain satisfaction and pride in sustaining their family. If not for me, these people would have nothing. They would suffer. They would die. These children would be lost. They'd be on the streets. But because of me, So many opportunities, so much happiness can be provided. Now, just try to think about Indra's position. He provides the rain, according to this verse we're reading today, to all the planets in the universe, from Swarga Loka down. And Krishna tells in Gita, all living beings subsist on food, and food is born due to rains. Without rain, everyone dies. Yes? During the monsoons, we think, oh, what an inconvenience, so much rain. But what would be the inconvenience if there wasn't monsoons? Again, it's the way Krishna arranges things. Everything is very instructive. Tapasya. Tapo divyam putra kayena satvam. Tapasya means to accept an inconvenience for a higher purpose. That's what material life is about. Nobody really likes when it rains. It's muddy. You can't go out. You can't do so many things. Last year we had a big pandal set up in, <laughs> in November and massive rains came and the pandal started breaking and water started flowing and the whole area was mud and people were afraid we shouldn't take anyone there because if, you know, there's thousands of liters of water stored on the top of the pandal and if it breaks it, can, it could kill people. Yes, be a very intense Abhishek. <laughs> so we're thinking, why rain? Stop the rain. People were praying to, for the rain to stop. Yes, but actually this is tapasya. Everything is ultimately nourished through tapasya. Our spiritual lives are nourished by taking some inconvenience for a higher purpose. And we can only survive by tolerating inconvenience. Rain is an inconvenience. But without it, we suffer and we die. Now Indra, he's in charge of the rain for all the planets. So can you imagine what kind of father, mother, we are all his dependents. The type of satisfaction that gives him, that everyone is depending on what I provide for them. All life, every species, even the camels can't last long. Even the cactus cannot last long ultimately without water. We all need. And he's providing. But even he and all the other devas, when they become too much proud, the tendency is they make offenses, aparads, mistakes, and then there's karmic reactions, and it's beyond their control. And in that state, urgently, with all their hearts, minds, and souls, they turn to Vishnu. Save us. And then, 
you know, all their piety and all of their everything else they do to maintain their positions is no longer relevant. They surrender. So Krishna is so kind that he comes to this world to teach all different levels of self-realization. He empowers different people for different purposes. All ultimately meant to bring them Vedaishta Saravaraham Eva Vedya. The Vedas describe so many different paths to bring people to different levels of consciousness, mainly just a better material state of consciousness. But it's all for the purpose of ultimately knowing Krishna and loving Krishna. And we find this in every religion. The vast majority of all followers, they interpret their particular scripture or their particular teacher in such a way to just live a, a little better, more comfortable, materialistic life. And hopefully, you know, after death, there may be some other heaven that I can go. But the true saints of all spiritual paths are teaching Sarva Dharma and Parityasya. You have to be a completely selfless servant, lover of God, to actually achieve the transcendental pleasure of bhakti, of prema. And Srila Prabhupada explains that Krishna explains all of these different levels of consciousness in a very um, summarized, concise way in Bhagavad Gita. And ultimately comes to the conclusion. Man manabhava mad bhakto mad yajim nam namaskaru. Worship me, become my devotee. Offer your homage to me. Always think of me. <clears throat> this way you will come to me without fail. It's the conclusion. And then Krishna comes in this age of Kali as Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to teach us how to reach the ultimate conclusion of the Gita and beyond in such a simple, powerful way that anyone and everyone could follow. His message, he cites the Srimad Bhagavatam. Kaleru dosandide raja nasti he kumahan guna kirtanad eva krishna sya mukta sangha parambraje. This age of Kali is, it is an ocean of faults. Not a puddle, not a river, not a lake, an ocean of faults. In fact, all the rivers are heading toward the ocean. 